Okay, it's eight o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week seven of Cardio Echo, reducing the burden of hypertension. Um, I'm going to go around the room here and introduce our, our hub team here. I'm Jim Warner, Case Western Reserve University, I'm a behaviorist. I'm Gotham Rao, I'm a uh, physician and uh, director of Echo. Uh, Jackson Wright, uh, Case Western Reserve uh, University Hospitals. Uh, I am the um, Emeritus Professor of Medicine here and also uh, a co-chair of uh, Team Best Practices for Cardio. I'm Rick Cunaccio, the web content producer for Cardio. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rao. Okay, so this is our structure this morning. So we have a, a presentation by Dr. Wright and we'll have a very interesting case study. Um, and Vaughn, these are our disclosures that you can read at your leisure. So today's attendees include um, Drs. Taylor and Wright, and these are some of our other regular attendees as well. Um, and this is a, a very important uh, topic. Obviously, African Americans uh, suffer disproportionately from, from hypertension. So, Dr. Wright, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Gotham. Um, uh, we will be discussing uh, the management of hypertension in African Americans. Uh, the objectives of the of the uh, talk is are listed here. Uh, the epidemiology and impact of hypertension in African Americans. Uh, provide it, uh, two guideline based recommendations for the uh, treatment of hypertension among African Americans, uh, and uh, a, a culturally sensitive approach to uh, recommending lifestyle and and uh, medication management for adult uh, African-American uh, patients. Uh, uh, we'll deal less, less with that than the, uh, at, at only as part of the uh, treatment recommendations. Uh, about uh, three years ago, uh, the, um, uh, the incidence of, of uh, hypertension increased uh, in the U.S. from 32 percent all the way up to 46 percent. Uh, this was as a result of the change in the threshold for the diagnosis of hypertension. Um, going down to, to the race eth ethnicity part of the, of the slide, uh, you'll see that um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, prevalence of hypertension in, in Afri non Hispanic uh, blacks uh, 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 nearly approached, went from about the mid 40s up to almost 60%. Uh, compared to uh, the uh, about 30 percent, uh, up to around 45 percent in in non-Hispanic whites, uh, uh, somewhere around 43 percent in in Hispanics, and 40 percent in in uh, Asian uh, non-Hispanic Asians. In uh, 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 high, uh, African American uh, populations, uh, hypertension generally occurs at a younger age uh, and is uh, generally more resistant to treatment particularly a resistant to treatment with specific uh, drugs, those that affect the renin uh, angiotensin system, uh, including uh, uh, beta blockers. Uh, the mortality in African Americans, it is the major cause of mortality. About 30% uh, uh, in females, uh, in males, and 20% in, of the mortality in, in males, black males. Uh, uh, Blacks are about, uh, about uh, a 30 percent higher incidence of non-fatal strokes, uh, 1.8 or almost two-fold uh, in a greater uh, incidence of fatal strokes, uh, about 50 percent higher rates of, of uh, cardiovascular death, uh, and about four times greater risk of end-stage renal disease. Uh, in uh, it can be up to 20-fold greater in in uh, uh, blacks between the ages of 18 and 45. Uh, these numbers have changed very little over the past decade. When we talk about the uh, morbidity and mortality of, of, uh, hi of hypertension in black populations, uh, we can't ignore uh, the, the uh, social determinants of health. I've spent uh, the bulk of my career trying to, uh, as many have, uh, trying to identify uh, the genetic components uh, to the uh, responsible for the increased uh, incidence of the uh, morbidity and mortality from hypertension in blacks. Um, uh, bottom line is it boils down to the bulk of the, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the excess of mortality and, and risk of hypertension is uh, related to uh, social 
uh, determinants uh, rather than uh, genetic causes. I always uh, show this slide, this was actually provided by uh, Adam Prozinski, uh, showing uh, that in fact, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, on this slide shows the life expectancy uh, of, of a population, of the population within a mile, uh, the Huff area of Cleveland, uh, about a mile from uh, the uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, University Hospitals and Case Western Reserve, uh, the life expectancy is about 64 years, uh, whereas uh, the, uh, in Lyndhurst, which is about eight miles away, uh, the, the uh, life expectancy is, is uh, 88, uh, going to 89 years. Uh, this is all so that the zip code becomes a greater, uh, uh, poses a, a, a greater risk of, uh, of mortality than does uh, uh, genetics. Uh, when we get into treatment, uh, uh, this is an algorithm uh, that is frequently used uh, for the management of hypertension in, in, in many populations and is included in the um, uh, treatment algorithm in many uh, quality improvement programs around the country, including here in Cleveland. Uh, generally, uh, and this is also the, uh, the algorithm that is in our hypertensive change package uh, for uh, the, uh, quality, uh, the hypertension quality improvement program uh, associated with, with cardio. Generally start with low dose combination uh, diuretic or, and RAS inhibitor, uh, uh, and, uh, and then you would increase uh, that, uh, the, the dose of the uh, ACE inhibitor and, uh, or RAS inhibitor and, and diuretic. Uh, subsequent uh, with the addition of the di uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker um, uh, and then the addition of a spironolactone uh, or uh, uh, as well as the introduction, potentially the introduction of going from hydrochlorothiazide to chlorothalidone and uh, uh, then uh, further down the, the addition of, of other agents. Uh, this is a, a very effective uh, regimen one of the challenges uh, in, with this approach, uh, though, is that uh, the, using the combination, fixed dose combination of uh, hydrochlorothiazide and a RAS inhibitor, the, the, uh, uh, the agents available, the fixed dose combinations available, generally underdose uh, the thiazide diuretic uh, hydrochlorothiazide. And so that, um, uh, and what, then you, you will see is uh, this is the, um, uh, and what is seen in many programs uh, or data such as these, this is from the Kaiser uh, uh, program. Uh, uh, these are uh, in, uh, quality improvement program. Uh, this is uh, going from, I think about uh, 2009 up to about 2014, showing the increase in hypertension control rates that they were able to achieve uh, in, in both uh, uh, whites and in black hypertensives within the Kaiser, especially the uh, West Coast uh, Kaiser program. And you see there's a, a dramatic increase in control rates. However, there is, remains about a, a 10, and the, the gap between uh, control rates in, in non-Hispanic blacks and non-Hispanic whites um, uh, uh, diminished uh, o over that period of time, but remained in, in, in most programs somewhere between five and 10% lower hypertension control rates in black populations compared to whites, not Hispanic whites. Similarly, uh, this is a, the quality improvement program out of the VA, which has been published again, showing dramatic increase uh, in hypertension control rates uh, in uh, uh, most ethnic in uh, all ethnicities, uh, but again, you see about uh, a, 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 a five to ten percent lower control rate in blacks compared to whites. And more recently, uh, Brent Egan, uh, who's done a lot of quali hypertension quality improvement uh, uh, throughout the uh, the Carolinas. Again, if you go down to the bottom of the of the slide hypertension control rates in black and white populations, which you see is again, uh, at baseline, you start out with 
about a 67% control rate in non-Hispanic whites. Uh, <clears throat> and this is to less than 140, about a 56, 57%, uh, about 10% uh, lower, a lower rate of control in, in blacks uh, and uh, increasing uh, to in, in uh, whites to about 76%, uh, but, uh, and to 70% um, in, in blacks. Uh, but again, you see that, uh, uh, again, five to 10% lower uh, rate of hypertension control rates in blacks compared to whites. These are, getting to some of the issues that may be responsible, these are data that were pulled out of uh, uh, Medicaid uh, uh, populations here in Ohio. These are patients whose blood pressure um, uh, were, was not controlled. Uh, so these are in uncontrolled uh, Medicaid uh, patients uh, within uh, uh, Medicaid practices with, within, in, within Ohio. It's a sampling, about 1,549 in, in the sample. And what you see is if you look at the, uh, the uh, hydrochlorothiazide doses, uh, what you see is the bulk of them, uh, uh, the bulk of the dosage is, is somewhere between 12 and a half and 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide is, is the dose of hydrochlorothiazide used. Um, we'll say that there is uh, the only study that has looked at 12 and a half and 25 of hydrochlorothiazide in clinical outcome trials uh, was not as, uh, was less effective uh, than its com the comparative uh, comp uh, 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 agent uh, in the only trial uh, that actually looks at uh, those doses of hydrochlorothiazide. The, the doses used in the clinical outcome trials are 25 and 50 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as you can see, only about two percent of the of patients on hydrochlorothiazide, even in uncontrolled patients, uh, uh, are on 50 milligrams of uh, of hydrochlorothiazide. In addition, less than 10 percent are on chlorothaladone, more effective in lowering blood pressure. Uh, it, it obviously, uh, certainly, only about six percent, less than six percent on um, on spironolactone. And you see about half of the patients on amlodipine are on the lower dose. And again, these are in uncontrolled uh, hypertensive patients. Uh, so that it does mean that, that uh, um, intensification of therapy uh, is an uh, issue and may explain a, a, a lot of the uncontrolled hypertension within uh, the Medicaid population uh, in, uh, that, that we in fact are following. But importantly, uh, there is a, uh, the, um, uh, uh, this is particularly important in black patients, uh, the underuse of uh, underdosing of thiazide diuretics in this, pop in this patient population. Now, this is an algorithm uh, from the SPRINT trial. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the only difference between this algorithm is rather than starting with um, uh, the fixed dose hydrochlorothiazide uh, RAS inhibitor combination. This actually starts with uh, either, in, particularly in black patients, uh, with uh, either uh, chlorothaladone, uh, 12 and a half, uh, it, uh, or amlodipine, and then the addition of the, uh, subsequently, the addition of the RAS in, in, inhibitor, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, amlodipine. Uh, and uh, then spironolactone. So that uh, the only difference between uh, this algorithm uh, is the uh, use of chlorothaladone uh, rather than hydrochlorothiazide in, in, uh, 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 in the treatment regimen. Importantly, with that treatment regimen, uh, uh, these are the blood pressures uh, that were able to be achieved uh, 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 with uh, on that regimen, uh, and as you can see, uh, in, in 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 Sprint, uh, patients were controlled to either less than 140, a systolic blood pressure of less than four, 140, or to uh, the systolic blood pressure of less than 120. And as you can see, even in non-Hispanic blacks, we were able to achieve uh, the uh, a, a dramatic reduction uh, in blood pressure 
uh, systolic blood pressure and sustained it throughout the trial over a period of here of uh, uh, three years, over three years, uh, even to less than one uh, systolic blood pressure less than 120, even in black patient populations. And so this becomes the uh, the uh, regimen that uh, generally recommending in in certainly in black patients and in patients who are not controlled would be to uh, uh, utilize uh, and should not consider a patient as being resistant uh, unless they are on adequate doses of a thiazide type diuretic, uh, and, and particularly chlorothaladone. Uh, in addition to achieving the blood pressure, the uh, dramatic re reductions in blood pressure in that low, uh, that intensively uh, uh, treated group to less than 120, uh, this looks at uh, the cardiovascular outcomes in the SPRINT trial, showing the uh, benefit was achieved, a similar benefit was achieved in the African-Americans uh, as well as non-African-American populations within that trial. Now, one of the reasons that uh, uh, for the uh, uh, potential effectiveness of chlorothaladone uh, is the fact that it is, uh, in addition to being twice as potent as hydrochlorothiazide, it also has a very long half-life, anywhere from uh, 48 to 72 hours. Uh, uh, there are several, there, there are data uh, out there, significant data out there that show less adherence in black patients compared to uh, non-black populations. The reasons for that, we, uh, it, it's the basis of another discussion, but one of the ways to, uh, uh, with the use of longer acting drugs like chlorothaladone, it's more tolerable, it's uh, more tolerable uh, with uh, the uh, lower adherence rates, a missed dose doesn't have the impact on loss of blood pressure control uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, management with hydrochlorothiazide. And the same with uh, cal the uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker amlodipine. Amlodipine has a, about a 60, 50 to 60 hour uh, half-life. And so again, is also very tolerant to uh, uh, is, is uh, to uh, uh, miss doses, or certainly more study we published about two years ago. This is from the African American study of kidney disease. In that study, these are uh, hypertensive black patients uh, with uh, a CKD. That's probably the the most resistant patient population in the management of hypertension out there. And as you can see, even in uh, these black patients with a hypertensive CKD. Uh, we were able to achieve blood pressures uh, less than the recommended 130 over 80, uh, even in that patient population. Of course, in managing, managing patients who are more resistant, and certainly in African-American patients, the uh, team-based care approach has uh, had a 1A recommendation in the 2017 AHA ACC hypertension guideline. And so a team-based care approach is uh, clearly uh, the uh, approach of choice uh, in the management of hypertension. So in conclusion, um, I think we can no longer use minority or even black race as, as an excuse for inadequate blood pressure control. Uh, we do have the therapeutic tools to manage and control the disorder to the recommended targets, even in the most severe hypertensive patient subgroups. It will require uh, uh, measures uh, to address uh, the failure to intensify treatment to achieve the, uh, 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 the uh, required uh, uh, metrics for hypertension control, uh, greater use of, of chlorothaladone, amlodipine, and also spironolactone will be needed to achieve and maintain blood pressure control, uh, and this is especially when adherence is a challenge. It will require a greater emphasis on lifestyle modification, which we did not have time to, to address, uh, but uh, uh, this is something that is uh, uh, clearly needed, and the management of hypertension starts with lifestyle modification, and it will uh, to reduce the need for uh, a drug treatment, uh, and uh, it also will lessen uh, the drug requirements for control, and also team-based care is essential especially to address the social determinants of health. Uh, I think that's it, yeah. Thank you, Jackson.
Uh, I have one question before we open it up to the audience, and that deals with intensification and, and the use of hydrochlorothiazide. So that slide you showed us from, from ODM, from, from Ohio, I assume that's not just solo therapy that they're on. They're on additional agents, yeah. they're uncontrolled. Um, and I was taught, and I don't sometimes you, if you add 12 and a half milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide, you get a synergistic effect with whatever and other antihypertensives they're on. Is that not the case? Or? It, uh, 12 and a half is not ineffective in reducing blood pressure. Uh, uh, it is, uh, but uh, the, uh, it is certainly much less effective uh, than, uh, than higher doses. And in fact, the, uh, the doses that are typically used uh, are in fact, um, and if blood pressure can be controlled on 12 and a half, uh, then th that's one thing. But the, <coughs> the fact remains that Many patients uh, are are left at twelve and a half, and it's, it's not titrated up. In addition, uh, there is um, um, uh, you do not have the clinical outcome data on twelve and a half of hydrochlorothiazide that you have on twenty five fifty and on the uh, the twelve and a half and twenty five of chlorothaladone, uh, and you certainly see a much better uh, blood pressure uh, control. Uh, and uh, uh, with those doses of thiazides. Uh, in fact, uh, I think a typical, for those of us who uh, run hypertension control uh, referral clinics, uh, generally patients referred in, the first thing that we do is uh, generally increase the dose of diuretic, uh, of the thiazide type diuretic, and, and uh, just send them back to the practice. So we shouldn't bother with 12 and a half at all. Uh, like uh, the only uh, the only uh, reason uh, that uh, we start with twelve and a half, you can do it uh, with the uh, the as indicated the fixed dose uh, therapy, uh, starting with uh, the uh, low dose twelve and a half uh, of hydrochlorothiazide along with a, a RAS inhibitor right. is fine, but you need to rapidly titrate up to. Uh, uh, to uh, the 25 and then to chlorothaladone. Many people are afraid of the, uh, the hypokalemia and metabolic consequences of, of the, uh, the uh, chlorothaladone, especially if you get up to 25. Uh, and, uh, but uh, spironolactone in low doses is uh, very effective in ameliorating the, uh, uh, the hypokalemia uh, if it does occur and is also are very effective in uh, uh, in reducing blood pressure and becomes the, uh, the in fact is the treatment of choice in patients who who are truly resistant. So that uh, and at, at doses of of uh, uh, twenty five to fifty is uh, generally uh, without substantial uh, side effects. I wanted to say that we had a group uh, where we were using uh, intensification of the medication. And we also did team therapy with a nurse practitioner or a pharmacologist, pharmacist changing the medicine. They would come in every two weeks until their blood pressure was controlled. And our group of patients, this was when we were with Kaiser, there was no disparities in blood pressure control between the African American and the other patients. Uh, we never got a chance to try and see why that was so because, of course, Kaiser left Cleveland. We also used some cultural uh, interventions with those patients, and we had very good blood pressure control. Here at Bedford now, we did have a pharmacist for a while, uh, seeing the patients and changing their medicines. Uh, that takes away physician inertia. A lot of times we may get busy and not necessarily change the medications uh, like we should. Uh, the patients need to come in every two weeks until they are control. And I just wanted to say that at Greater Health Cleveland, uh, those results were presented in different places. We never got a chance to find out why there was no disparities between African Americans and Caucasians when we had that intervention. Yeah. yeah and what, yeah. what Pamela is mentioning, Jackson, is that we at, at some of the other Kaiser sites, like you showed, there was a disparity. He showed the and but but not at the not at the site. So that was but yeah, I never really no, determined why. Site, right. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I guess the one comment that I would raise is uh, the idea would be to look 
particularly at patients who are not controlled and uh, and look at the uh, the uh, the uh, drug treatment strategies that are being used in those patients. In many of those patients, uh, simply uh, those a focus on those patients in increasing uh, the uh, the uh, diuretic uh, dose uh, is uh, can be very effective in uh, reducing uh, or increasing uh, the control rates. And I think that's probably uh, for uh, as we look at the the hypertension control uh, in the Medicaid population in Ohio, it's probably what what we are uh, uh, advocating uh, is uh, the greater use of, uh, of uh, uh, chlorothaladone, which automatically increases the, uh, uh, the, the di diuretic dose as well as the tolerability. Uh, and that will be, uh, my bet is that uh, that will dramatically increase uh, the, uh, the control rates uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the uncontrolled patients uh, uh, that we are following. Thank you, Pam and Thank Sherry. You. I just wanted to share a, a perspective that's consistent with that. First of all, um, it's unlikely to be, a, as Jackson said, a purely genetic issue. I was reading just yesterday a, uh, uh, an article about African immigrants to the United States and their rates of hypertension, which are no, no higher than the general population, except in the second and third generation. But, so, but the other thing I would say is that team-based care and some different models of care do work because they unburden physicians with more responsibility uh, and can overcome clinician clinical inertia. Another approach that we're trying to take is uh, empowerment, uh, patient empowerment. And so Peter Pronovos and I wrote an editorial recently about defects in care and how patients with diabetes are entitled to care that is free of defects, just as if you purchased a new car, you're entitled to a car that doesn't have any defects. That means, yes, you get intensification of diabetes treatment, your flu shot, et cetera. And empowering patients to not demand that, but to make to discuss those issues with their healthcare provider. That way you don't need a whole team, which is hard to do. I mean, it's wonderful that some places have them. And you don't rely upon um, physicians or other providers entirely to initiate that care. So a patient with uncontrolled hypertension comes in and is asked to ask the question, how come I'm on only 12 and a half milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide? Or how come you're not intensifying my treatment because my blood pressure is too high? So there's a great deal of patient education involved as well. So many different approaches that might work. Let's tackle this uh, as best we can. I, I wanted to ask Jim and Chris to comment mostly, and, I, and I'll get Jackson's input at the end about what well, we just basically had a discussion about uh, intensifying treatment, but we'll get his perspective as well. Let me offer my perspective on, on this patient of, of which I've seen many. Um, and I used to be the director, as many of you know, of a, a very large pediatric obesity center. And many of the families would have an interest in alternative treatments. Many of them are interested in secondary genetic causes of obesity. For example, the extremely rare Pratt or Willie syndrome. And all these children had cardiovascular risks. And, and many of the parents smoked and had a number of unhealthy habits. In my experience, the best approach is not to confront them about that immediately. Although this, this lady has many behaviors which are inconsistent with her beliefs. Uh, you know, she's smoking in the car. I hope this autistic child is not always with her when that happens, for example, um, who may not even be able to, to express any um, discomfort or, or, or object to it. Um, so, so there's many inconsistent beliefs, but rather than going down that route, you can say, well, look, what do you think would help you to lose weight? And you feel like you can do this on your own and not just lose weight, but to quit smoking, to control your blood pressure, et cetera, you're, or your cholesterol, because you're very resistant to it. And I'm sure she has some ideas. It may be a new diet. It may be I'm determined to start exercising. And you say, okay, that sounds wonderful. Let's do this. Let's set up an agreement whereby you go on this diet or you pursue this lifestyle choice for the next two or three months and you come back and you see me, and if it, there is no improvement, let's at least have an agreement that we will start to discuss uh, other treatments that may be more effective, such as medications, or such as a more rational approach to, to weight loss. Would that be something that you would be agreeable to? In my experience, most people will at least, at the very least, reluctantly say yes, or at the, the most, find that very reasonable. 
when we dealt with families who were concerned that their son or daughter must be the one hundredth of one percent that had a genetic cause of obesity, I said, I'm going to do some limited testing for you. But would you agree that if the testing is normal, we'll pursue a more conventional lifestyle approach? And that tends to get them engaged a little bit more. The fear is if you don't engage this patient, as Mary said, she's going to suffer some health consequences. She's also going to seek out those alternatives elsewhere if it's not from you, if you're not offering them. So you do need to offer them. I'm going to turn things over maybe to Jim to get his thoughts for some more. Um, Kristen. Yeah, uh, thank you for presenting this case. Really interesting. Uh, you know, this patient has apparently stressors in her life uh, with the, uh, a child with autism and, and perhaps uh, financial stressors. I don't know, uh, maybe a history of adverse childhood experiences that are still uh, problematic for that patient and is eating to soothe anxiety. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of address that aspect of, of this case. Uh, you know, she has real, she's very sensitive to issues of autonomy and control, um, and she wants to do things on her own. It's interesting, and, and it's, it's actually a positive sign that she's uh, tried different dietary approaches. She's willing to do things and try to do things on her own. Um, you know, what I wanted to just take a second to talk about is, you know, we, we look at a page like this and think, well, you know, why are they so self-destructive? And... Uh, there are physiological pathways that, that explain this kind of eating, this binge eating uh, that contributes to the weight problem. And um, so we know that you know, when uh, an individual ingests carbohydrates and fats together, they stimulate dopamine, endogenous opioids, and serotonin. So there's an immediate reinforcing uh, factor there that takes place, whereas guilt and shame that may take place afterwards is not immediately associated with the food intake, and so it doesn't get reinforced in the same way. Um, there's also, in, in response to stressors, the HPA axis gets activated, and in people with insulin resistance, uh, this can be especially problematic with respect to their appetite hormones, their satiation hormones, and their cortisol, and so um, that can also uh, really create problems for increased appetite and not be feeling full when they do eat. So those are some of the physiological explanations as I see them. And then, you know, what are the potential interventions? Since the, the patient is uh, interested in alternative and complementary therapies, uh, you could present a menu potentially of different options that the patient might uh, be able to choose from if she doesn't uh, have her own ideas. And the evidence-based therapy really for binge eating disorder, one of them is mindfulness uh, interventions, mindfulness meditation. And um, so this is, falls into the realm of complementary therapies. And so the patient perhaps may be receptive to that. And this is really just uh, the patient learning to examine their thoughts and feelings non-judgmentally and look at what triggers cravings and what is actually real hunger and to be able to differentiate those sensations within themselves. And so um, it's a fairly simple and straightforward uh, method uh, for, for using mindfulness, but it's not easy to um, develop the skills uh, and it takes some persistence to do that. I would be happy to send uh, out uh, a step-by-step, -step, uh, very simple mindfulness uh, technique that patients can use. Also, some patients are more interested in bodily interventions. And some of those, you know, uh, would be in the alternative medicine realm, diaphragmatic breathing and pro progressive muscle relaxation, yoga, tai chi, and massage. Those are all potentially helpful for reducing stress. Uh, they may not get at the emotional eating directly, but they could help reduce stress. So those are, those are my thoughts. Those are some, those are some really helpful thoughts. And I think that she may not be interested in behavioral health, but if it's framed as and this is just my approach. I say, it sounds like you have a pretty stressful life. You're looking after this special needs child. You've got um, your own health issues. Um, I don't know what her employment uh, situation is, et cetera. Uh, perhaps stress reduction would be helpful. Let's take that out from you know, your hypertension, your diabetes, your, your obesity for a moment and say, let's, and then maybe talk about some of the options that, uh, that Dr. Werner had talked about. Before I, I turn things over to Chris, I, I just want to know what people's thoughts are about 
Um, stress reduction is important, but let's talk about lifestyle uh, changes to promote a, a healthier blood pressure and weight. How would you get started uh, with that discussion? Any, any thoughts uh, about, about that? I mean, I know she's tried a number of things and Mary's obviously been working with her for a long time, but what new options or alternatives do you think would be helpful? Learning how to enjoy the preparation of food from scratch at home as the activity instead of the eating of food and, and turning it around and talking about how little time we spend preparing healthy food and how much more enjoyable it is and being mindful when you're eating about what you're putting into your body. I mean, I think for her, you know, she's probably feeling very unhappy after she has that big binge mm -hmm. and sometimes if you're at home roasting vegetables or doing something that's healthy and then you eat it, you actually have this feeling of of happiness and doing the right thing. So I, I know that's a hard conversation when people are busy, but actually I've had quite a bit of a success with it because people do understand that, you know, being in a fast food line is somewhat stressful <laughs> and going home and making something that takes less time actually than sitting in a fast food line. Here we have double wide fast food lines for McDonald's and you know, sometimes the, the line out of Popeye's is all the way to the street. So we talk about, like, you know, if you go home and you have 30 minutes to cook instead of 30 minutes to sit in a fast food line, you might actually relax and enjoy that time as opposed to thinking of it as stressful. So That's, a, that's a, some good suggestions. I mean, the whole idea of rediscovering food, which uh, in the African-American community is a movement that's starting to rise up uh, a great deal. Um, you know, going back to food that people's grandparents or great grandparents ate. So that might be one one thing to to think about. Binge eating disorder. And I, I know she binges. Uh, you'd have to be a bit more specific in inquiring about that history. Really, is loss of control eating. And if you've ever seen it, I've seen videotapes with you know parents kind of or spouses kind of filming their children. It's very very distressing to watch people eat because I don't think they're enjoying. I think they. They feel better, as, as Jim said, for a short period of time. And then there's this incredible guilt that sets in, but there's no way that one would enjoy eating that specific way. And sometimes it's, it's even the type of food doesn't matter. It's not even something they like sometimes. So it's a way of relieving stress and anxiety that's very, very self-destructive. So I wanna give uh, Chris a few minutes to talk about his approach to uh, lifestyle changes in this, in this young lady. So I think there are a lot of things kind of happening here, I think. Um, being in the category with public assistance would make opportunities for other um, food assistance resources um, that could be available and I know they are available within the area. In some ways I think the fact that she has this job where she's going around and being a home appraiser makes her more mobile around the resources that she has in the community. So it's not as if she's in an isolated community and kind of never gets out. Um, but the fact that her job requires her to kind of circulate around through the different communities actually gives her more access to foods that are available, um, resources that might be available, um, whether they be healthcare, food, otherwise. Um, and also maybe even just in the area, there are so many kind of natural, um, habitats and natural parks that are kind of out there that kind of give some of that outdoor therapy. It seems like the CBD and the food is kind of serving as that anxiety um, release that if we can identify some of those other things that might be um, enjoyable to her, um, it might kind of help transition away from um, some of the smoking and some of the uh, food related behaviors. Um, that are kind of leading into this. And then a lot of times if you start moving away from smoking cessation, it's the, what do I do with my hands and my mouth um, to make that process happen? And I, I realize pretzel sticks might not be the absolute best option, but I think they're probably healthier than cigarettes. Um, and then if you can kind of make that transition of so instead of smoking, have pretzel sticks and see if that kind of helps take care of some of the kind of what am I supposed to do with my hands and, and that situation um, or some of those food strategies. 
Um, and then the other question that I had was, did I read that correctly, that it's her mother, herself, and her child um, together? Yes, I did. the mother, her mother. Okay. So it's, so it's, a, it's a three idea. generational, her mother, her, and the child. And I do think her mother is helpful. There doesn't seem to be a lot of friction. At least she's not shared that with me with the mother. Um, I think there is friction with the biological father, but he's not in the household at this time. Um, because I think that becomes another resource to kind of help her manage. It seems like the stress of a very high needs child is, um, is going to add to this. So in what ways can her mother perhaps help with food situation um, that they can tag team around? And it sounds like they already are, especially with her traveling of kind of managing the child as well as managing all of the other expectations of the household in terms of utilizing that um, support. And then finally, with the dietitian that you have within the clinic, I think sometimes um, they get mired down in the dietary change and they don't have as much time as you have um, from this historic perspective of what her challenges are. I think being able to share that with the dietitian um, directly, the electronic medical record actually makes it a little harder for them to find that information um, at times. So being able to kind of say, these are the main challenges that I see and how can we focus on these specific elements? When I taught community nutrition, I kind of felt my job was to be the nutrition zealot out of students before you got, they got to medical nutrition therapy. So they could remember people and resources and reasons why they eat and things like that um, to kind of facilitate that counseling a little bit more specifically. So, thank you, Chris. So what I heard from both Chris and, and, and Jim, I think, is that, um, and, and I agree with this, I don't think I would take on her blood pressure, lifestyle changes, salt reduction, caloric reduction, exercise head on, but ask her what kinds of things she enjoys. You know, she gets out, as, as Chris said, and does these home appraisals, and are there things that she can do simultaneously or, or around that time? And maybe, you know, she's stressed, let's take that angle, there were some studies from Germany about 15 years ago where stress reduction was the sole treatment for obesity, and it was compared in randomized trials to more conventional approaches, and it was just as effective. Now, obviously, they selected the, the patients uh, carefully to, to look at um, how, um, uh, you know, people that were obviously suffering from stress as well, but I think in this case, it might be very effective. So a question from Metro Health, any data on Fitbits with competition? So Fitbits are typically used for less than 90 days and then discarded um, uh, for the most part. And uh, of course, if you use it regularly, many people in this room probably fall into that category, um, it can be helpful. Uh, for this patient, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I think Mary would have to let us know if that's something she may have tried already. I have no idea. Um, so I want to get back to uh, the final issue was with respect to management of her hypertension and give uh, Jackson a couple of minutes as well. Jackson. Yeah. Uh, now, her blood pressure is uh, uh, probably uh, the one of the lesser challenges uh, that she has. She's only on two medications, as, as indicated. She's only on a fairly uh, low dose of one of those medications, uh, hydrochlorothiazide. But actually, uh, th there's another issue that we can probably talk about, and that is um, the combination of, uh, does the combination of a diuretic uh, with a calcium channel blocker work as well as a diuretic plus a RAS inhibitor? Um, the answer is uh, in, uh, uh, in non-blacks, uh, the um, uh, the, 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 and the studies have been done in non-Hispanic whites uh, versus uh, non-Hispanic blacks. Uh, there is um, the combination of a, of a calcium channel blocker and a RAS inhibitor is more potent in combination uh, than is a, a diuretic uh, plus a calcium channel blocker. Now, diuretic plus uh, RAS inhibitor uh, or RAS inhibitor is, is equally effective when added to a calcium channel blocker or a, a diuretic. Uh, but a diuretic and a calcium channel blocker is less effective 
uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in not Hispanic whites. Uh, it is equally effective in uh, not Hispanic blacks. Uh, so that uh, one approach uh, uh, in this uh, patient uh, may in fact be to, rather than increase the dose of the, of the, of the hydrochlorothiazide, would be to go to a RAS inhibitor, uh, replace the hydrochlorothiazide with a RAS inhibitor uh, in her. Um, uh, it would also uh, calcium channel blockers, especially in, in uh, uh, obesity, uh, especially in obese and especially in women, is more apt to produce uh, edema, uh, which would also be ameliorated by the, um, uh, by the uh, RAS inhibitor more so uh, than, and not by the uh, diuretic. Uh, the other point that I generally make is that uh, she's, a number of patients will want to uh, uh, try to look at the effect of lifestyle. My patients who are on treatment will want to look at the effect of changing their lifestyle and weight reduction versus um, um, uh, at before adding uh, or, or changing their drug uh, regimen uh, or certainly adding uh, to their drug regimen. And the approach generally that I generally use is to uh, contract with the patient that much rather um, uh, uh, add the medication and then back off. And, 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 it, and many patients are put on contract to reduce the, uh, to periodically uh, reduce the medication uh, if they do uh, respond well, to, if they do begin to uh, do, make the lifestyle changes, particularly weight loss uh, that uh, they are committed to. And, it's, and uh, the other uh, is that uh, patients who uh, maintain a lower blood pressure uh, for a prolonged period of time, generally longer than a year, many of them, uh, when you begin to withdraw medications, may in fact, if they continue to do the things that uh, uh, they are supposed to be doing, to, uh, then uh, they may in fact not, uh, may be able to taper them off some of their medication. So those are just simply a couple of points. Great, thanks. So if I hear you correct, Jackson, you would perhaps you replace amlodipine mm -hmm. with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thanks we, uh, everyone. We are just about out of time. Back to Shannon for a minute. Absolutely. Um, we have our echo clinics on our website. If you have missed something or if you wanna review one of the didactic presentations, you can do it there. And then finally, um, please complete your red cap survey. Today is your last day to um, opt out of sharing cohort contact information. Um, and we also have our post clinic survey. Next week is Dr. Jim Lamb from Wright State who will present special populations, the elderly and patients with disabilities. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone. Great week. Great week. Bye-bye.